uh, Soil Food Web Oregon, which is uh, Elaine Ingham. I don't know when it was, a long time ago. Me and Pat got her to come to North Carolina and present for us. And she ended up testing my uh, compost every week. I sent her a sample uh, in the process of making a, a high-end compost so she could see what the, how the biology changed per week, which was, I think, a big deal for her. She had never done that. And, uh, I think it really ramped up her experience with compost, too. Okay. A word about Elaine Ingham, you definitely want to see her. She talks. You definitely want to follow her. She's really inspired. She doesn't always have complete support from the same academic community that John was talking about. Yeah. Uh, she's a little bit more, more willing to go a little fast and furious and not spend a lot of time talking about every last thing that could be proved and go for results for farmers. So yeah. just know that. You may hear some people like really go, ooh, Elaine Ingham because of that. But she's yeah. inspired and she's done a lot of work and you should definitely check her out. If you can get to listen to her talk or something, it's just, it's, I've had people leave her talk and say that was a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's all about the life of the soil. She's yeah. got it. I mean, she's yeah. a, a major innovator in our, in, in our move to yeah. figuring out the soil. What happened to me, I was trying to figure out how compost could suppress diseases of plants. And that's how I leveraged some money to get some of these grants. And I did do it. I got 98% control of uh, rhizoctonia damping off in, uh, in growth chamber trials at Bloomsburg University. And that was, that was the best we did. We did from like 80 to 98 percent. No fungicide can do that. But that was a very specific <laughs> compost. It's, it's not easy to do, and it was hard to replicate. And then how are you going to market it? Well, if I wanted to market that compost, I have to call it a biocontrol agent, and I have to get registered with the EPA. It could be 10 years of testing, so bye-bye on that project. But uh, so what happened was I was figuring out ways to, uh, how was I going to verify that I had disease suppression. Actually, we sent loop key compost to the uh, soil microbial systems lab in Beltsville so they could show that, it, so they could get proof because they weren't going to be able to prove it otherwise. They didn't know what good compost was. Um, and I was all about how am I going to do this? How am I going to how am I going to figure out? Well, uh, who else got disease suppression? It was the loop keys in Austria, and it was this crazy lady at Oregon State University. She was still at Oregon State University when I when I met her. And I, and I talked to my other buddies in the compost world, and they said, oh, no, she's got testing, and, and you can do this. So I got a ticket, and I went to her class, which was still taught at Oregon State University in 1996. And it was me and, uh, like, six guys from the USDA and a uh, potato consultant. <laughs> and the USDA guys, I was like, well, what are you guys doing here, you know? <laughs> within, a, within two years, they, they created uh, the Soil Biology Primer which is online, you might want to write that down. It tells the functions of soil microorganisms, uh, how they work in the soil, how, they, how it all comes together. And then you read that and you think, well, gee, I can't do anything about that. Well, Elaine, being a great pioneer, actually pioneered the biological soil testing systems too. So you can actually send stuff off. Now, it's not a cheap test. The whole soil food web might be $180. But compared to what it was right before that, it was four to five thousand dollars. So nobody could even access that. And so the only way to tell if you're getting disease suppressive would have been these little grow out trials. <coughs> anyway, so um, all that's a part of Elaine's legacy as a pioneer, amazing pioneer. What happens is she pisses people off. You know, she's a nice person, but she pisses people off. She also teaches classes currently at the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania. So yeah. if you want to really study how to look I down a microscope and pick out the germs, yeah. why, you can go there and find out. We may get her here to teach that here sometime. Actually. Yeah, she's the, uh, she's the head of that, uh, that farm now at Rodale. Yeah. She's the head research coordinator or whatever at the farm. She doesn't have a lot of time for niceties. Sometimes she's just not as diplomatic as people yeah. want to hear. And She's turning things around. They're, people it's like they're losing their footing and stuff, so it's really easy to react in a way that you know. <laughs> you and and she's pretty. Ridiculous. She's pretty adamant about. Well, we need to do this, this, and this to go organic tomorrow. And they're like, well, we can't do that. No, no, you have to. You yeah. know. And then, then they start going. <laughs> Wait a second. Like you know, I said, not no. very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't. Right. She doesn't okay, love. so we probably need to move on. Okay, so actually you're... making compost and stuff, right? Yeah. So we're, our piles over there. Right? Yeah, piles over there. We're gonna. We're going to gather a few more materials here and then we're going to walk over there gathering some weeds and stuff as we go to get the green part for our pile. Um, and Juan, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Go behind the greenhouse under my glove and the cup holder is the key and bring the truck over here so we can put some ingredients in. Okay. Where are we going, Pat? We're going to eventually go over there, but we got, we got a little bit of a dance to do to get there.
We're going to the compost site. We're going to gather some ingredients while oh, we go. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Um, so, while Juan's getting the truck, I'll talk about the ingredients we're going to gather. Um, John was talking about light and tight. That's about bulk density. Um, bulk density, John's got a good formula in there. If you weigh, take weight and volume, you can figure out bulk density. And for years, John would come to my compost pile with this long, you know, fancy composter thermometer, and he'd slide into my compost, he'd be shaking his head like, I still don't have a pat, you know? Maybe he tries, oh, a little better there, but you still don't have it. And then one time, I got it, and I got that stocky material is gold for compost. I mean, everybody's like, oh, where do I get the manure? Where do I get the grass clippings? It's everywhere. Food waste, you can get lots of high nitrogen. The bulking material that's not wood, that'll rot, is hard to come by. You know, so collecting stocky material is major, and I just got so much stocky material, I couldn't believe how much I needed. He came and he slid his thing and he smiled. <laughs> he graduated. <laughs> he smiled, you know. And then the next spring, after that compost had sat on a pause, I got to put it on a pause pile um, through the winter, and it ran and from late November until mid-January over 130 degrees. No turning, right? Yeah. Finally. In mid in mid January, it's probably coming down a little bit, and we had deep cold, like you know, near zero, 10 degree nights and stuff. I put it out. The next, by by March, it was back up to 80 something. Still had life in it. John looked at it in in June. He stopped. He looked. He got. I still remember. Pat, this is good stuff. He picked it up. And, Pat, this is good stuff. You know, he, I got it. You know, and yeah. the thing that was hardest to get was how much bulking you need. If that pile's going to breathe, right? If air's going to move easily through it, there has to be lots of bulking agent. Let's move back this way so he can pull in. What Pat was talking about is Mather's Maxims, right here. Something wet with something dry, something tight with something light, something fast with something slow, something sweet with something sour. So, I want everybody to hear that again when the truck stops. Ingham, I-N-G-H-A-M, okay. Elaine Ingham, okay, and she well, is an author of the Soil Biology Primer. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you can go online and the whole thing's online. It was this rare moment when the USDA and Elaine Ingham got along real well, and they created this amazing book, and then, poof, they got in a fight and haven't, haven't been talking too well to get sense. How long ago was that? That's the rule. The book came out in 1998, and uh, by about 2002, 2003, they're all pissed off at each other. And there's good reasons. I mean, I would be pissed too if I were her. Um, okay, so uh, this is the page you want to look at. Blend materials well, okay? Mathers Maxims. Everybody find that page. Right here, so it looks like this big Got it. Got it, got it. Okay, so uh, something wet with something dry. Well, that just means if you don't have enough moisture in your pile, you're not going to feed enough water to the biology and it ain't going to go anywhere. So we do this squeeze test. That's actually That's the correct very moisture. wet. See how wet that is? Mm -hmm. you're, getting, you're getting a lot of drips. That's actually very wet. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't look wet. It doesn't feel squeeze, wet. Squeeze. If you feel this, it feels damp. So, you know? so that would be a that would be pass it around. Let people give it a squeeze. That would be something wet. Squeeze hard, you know, and you'll see what the water. But comes just out. looking at it up there, you go, ah, it's not too wet. But it actually is. The um, wet you want is the wetness of a well wrung out sponge. Yeah. That's that's how wet you want. You squeeze really hard, and you get like one or two drops between okay. your fingers. And that's we could, ideal. We could do like moisture testers and all kinds of stuff, but really. <laughs> Once you get this thing, you, you know, you're, you're building in your intuitive stuff. You know, your, your head's way better at this than those And the look would, would just scoff at moisture meters. They're like, yeah. they're all useless. <laughs> just squeeze it, you know? And they were like really into precision, you know? But squeezing it works best, you know? So uh, you have to think about, in a way, you're, you're kind of predicting ahead how, how it's going to look all mixed together. So that stuff, you know, okay, right up here, well, that's, that's dry, but everything else is soaking wet. <laughs> This, this is pretty dry, and it's got tubes. These, these are, when, when you have a stocky material and you got air in the stocky material, that's really good. Straw, if you could get it, 
is like the best stuff because it starts out bulky and light and fluffy, but it composts to nothing. And nothing is awesome because now you're not screening or anything like that. So uh, something wet with something dry. Anything else you want to comment on the moisture? Um, John's got a wonderful, I never saw that before, but he talked about for larger scale and you can do it at home base too. You got really wet materials, really dry materials, you're gonna make a compost pile. If you can make a U, right, and have the wet stuff on the outside and the dry on the inside and let it sit for a couple days, migration. It evens out, you know? Especially if you're gonna do the pause thing, because the pause thing, you throw it into your thing, it's hard to get it off. You want it to sit there until it's done heating up. Yeah. So trying to get that moisture to even out. Juan, you experience that all the time, right? You think it's really dry, and then you mix the bottom in, and it's sopping wet, you know? And like, we go through this all the time. You know, Juan, I want to introduce Juan. Juan works with us here at the farm, and he's on the compost all the time. He's really become a master at getting that moisture right, you know? Just paying attention to how you let it all even out, you know? Um, okay, so we're gonna gather a few other materials. We're gonna gather a little straw. Um, normally I wouldn't use straw that we bought, but because we're doing a demo class, we would. I mean, <laughs> a good trick, by the way, a good tip, is go to your local feed and seed and see if they have a trailer where they sell straw from. Oh, yeah. See if you can get, if you can clean the trailer. See if you can get what falls on the ground. Now, the local one over here is high-end and really smart. They rebuild that stuff. Most uh -huh. of them haven't gotten there yet. You know, so you can probably get free straw. Free straw is worth composting. I personally, at six dollars a bale, I'm not going to buy a lot of straw to compost. For a home gardener, you might though. You might make one big pile in the fall and decide twelve bucks, eighteen bucks for my great compost. It's way worth it. You know, our scale. So the principle of what he's fit. saying is, your your, it's um, carbon and and strawy materials and bulking agents. They're fairly easy to stockpile. You can stockpile them, they're not going to rot too fast. Matter of fact, keep them covered, keep them dry. The nitrogen, the kicker, all that stuff's going to go fast, it's going to stink, you know, so you, you have to deal with that. So in the backyard situation, you might just stockpile leaves and keep them covered. And now spring comes and you got the stockpile leaves and now you're hitting it with the lawn clippings and the food and every other thing. And uh, the thing he was talking about, we, we on a commercial scale, we, we create that U, that's, we call that the lagoon or the premix. And it, the stuff sits in there and then once we think you got enough in there, then you hit it with a loader and you flip it. And that mix together is your pre-mix. Now it's pre-mix, it's staged, ready to go into the next step, which is put it out on the, on the pile. Right, with the, and that's when you'd be adding your high nitrogen and stuff in it like that. For the home scale garden kind of situation, your fall cleanup is gonna be really critical because you wanna save all that stocky material, keep that in the dry so it doesn't rot down to make your pile. And I really recommend for the home gardener um, that you make your compost pile in the fall when you're doing garden cleanup, because then you make one big crank and pile. You know, you have enough stuff to really get it hot. Pay attention. Use all the techniques we show you, and you'll make one great pile. We're going to talk how to make that one great pile do tons of stuff for you through the year, you know. And then you can switch to worms for your food waste when you're so busy in the summer, you know. And you can do other, other ways to deal with green waste and stuff like that, or just put it in piles, which will eventually go into a compost pile. But they won't, they won't, it won't hold as well. It's not going to be as prime, you know. Um, and so let's go get these other ingredients and head over. Yeah. Okay. So, right. the, so the carbons right. and these things, these are the light and the uh, manures and foods are something uh, tight. It's, we're talking about density now. Tell them about your little concrete block winter worm pile. Yeah, what, yeah. I, what I did was I learned from Bob Carnegie, you know, most things that we're experts on, we learn from other people, you know. Yeah. Bob Carnegie probably got it from Bruce Fulford, I think, you know, um, up at New Alchemy. But basically, you make, I have an insulated concrete block, three, three bin system with actually insulated doors that are clad in galvanized metal because I, I was right near the dumpsters and I was going to compost bakery waste, so I had to make it rap proof. It was rat proof, but they still would drive me nuts going in there trying to get in it. You know, they'd be running across my plants. They were, and what I did was, I grew my plants on top of that compost. I had a layer of soil in between, so that any ammonia and stuff was captured in the soil. That was my biofilter. And actually, the best thing to do, what Bob liked to do, is grow the plants right in that soil. Then the ammonia goes up from the compost, gets captured in the soil, the plants get it. You know? But I found it easier to not have transplant shock. I did it in plants. But they were right there, right at the, at the level. And I was able to heat my plants and I always made my compost in the spring then and I made three great piles. It made me focus and make three great piles. 
because I needed that heat to go for six to eight weeks. Ones are berry canes good for stalks. They are wonderful. They'll rot really well, especially if they're only one year old. That's kind of a rule. Stuff that's no more than one year old will rot real well. We'll growth that that's more than a year old tends to lignify too much and doesn't rot as well, too high carbon. The thing about, about the berry canes is what doesn't rot is the thorns. So if you're doing like fine work in a garden, you'll have all these little thorns, you know, so it's hard for your hands. If it's, if it's coarse work, then the thorns will eventually rot, but they take probably another year. Do you think it's a year or two years before those I don't know. I don't know. I've never really tested that. But they do show up. You know that one, yeah. right? Yeah. They, <laughs> they, they're just the last thing to rot. They're much harder. And they don't rot. So you have to be aware of that. But thorns are a good thing. I mean, what I like the berry, the cane stuff for, we're going to use some actually, is to put on the very bottom of the paws system to kind of make more of a um, air um, diet. What's that thing in there? Plenum. Plenum? Uh, well, plenum kind of, yeah, but I was going to use the other word. So what we have in there for that, this is the yeah. Diffuser? Diffuser, yes, the diffuser. 